in our quest to understand why quintic polynomials don't have a formula in radicals to solve them, we first need to figure out how exactly will we know when a polynomial has a solution for its roots in simple radicals. In other words, if a polynomial is solvable by radicals, how are we going to notice? The Galois correspondence gives us a way of taking a field extension, for example, the splitting field of a polynomial, and translating any question that we have about that field to instead be a question about groups, specifically the automorphism groups associated with that extension. So in our last video, we talked about why the quadratic and cubic polynomials have simple formulas and radicals, and we kind of backed up from knowing the formulas themselves, which we can just find out there, right? and figuring out what the splitting field of those polynomials has to be like, what the structure of that splitting field has to be like, in order to have such a formula. So we came up with a characterization in degrees 2 and 3. What we want to do now is take a step and make that more general. For any polynomial whose solution can be found with a simple formula in radicals, what does the structure of its splitting field look like? And then we want to hit this with the Galois correspondence to turn that question, what does its splitting field look like, into a different question about groups. What must its automorphism group look like? So when we left off, we were talking about the cubic formula and how in order to solve any cubic equation, to find the roots of any degree 3 polynomial, we need to make kind of at most these three simple extensions. And each of those extensions is a simple extension by an element which is just an nth root, in this case, just a square root or a cubed root. So at every step of this tower, we're just adjoining one element, which may or may not be new, but in general it might be, whose power belongs back to the previous step in the extension. So as we take powers, we go back down the tower. So what's the generalization that we want here? The generalization for a polynomial being solvable in radicals is going to have to do with the structure of its splitting field. So let's talk about the field that we built on the previous slide. We're going to call that field a radical extension of the base if it has that same kind of structure. First of all, that we have to have obtained it by building a tower starting at the base and taking finitely many steps to get to the top. But then when we take those steps, each of those steps is a simple extension. So we're extending just by a single algebraic element each time. And that that algebraic element has the property that some power of it lands us back in the previous field in the tower. So it's a tower with finitely many steps each of which is a simple algebraic extension by an element whose ijth power is in the previous step of the extension, the previous step in the tower. So in our quadratic formula case, we found out that the splitting field for any quadratic is going to be of the form q adjoin the square root of b squared minus 4c. So that square root is playing the role of our algebraic element here, alpha 1, in our simple extension. And the power, i sub 1, is 2, because if we take the second power of this element, we land back in the base field q. And so it could be, if p was irreducible, that we have to extend that square root in order to split our polynomial. But in general, if p wasn't irreducible, then the splitting field will just be some subfield of q adjoined the square root of b squared minus 4c. So we have to kind of allow for that little bit of wiggle room. That wiggle room is even more important in the cubic case. We saw how in order to split a cubic, we might need to adjoin three elements to q. Let's call them alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. Alpha 1 being the third root of unity, alpha 2 being the square root of this uh, discriminant quantity, and then alpha 3 being a cubed root of some combination of that square root of discriminant and delta 1. And the powers of these extensions, in other words, the roots that we're taking in order to make each of the steps in this tower, are 3, 2, and 3, respectively. So we might need all of these extensions, but we actually can't have all of them be non-trivial. So not all these are going to be necessary. So in general, we again are going to have a subfield uh, of this extension. We'll split a cubic. And so we're going to say that a polynomial is solvable in radicals. In other words, we will be able to find a simple formula in radicals to discover its roots starting from its coefficients if its splitting field is a subfield of one of these radical extensions. And if we're talking about polynomials that begin their life with rational coefficients, then we want the splitting field to be a subfield of a radical extension of the rationals. So that's what kinds of fields that we want to see as the splitting fields of our polynomials that have solutions in simple radicals. So now the question is, 
if we apply the Galois correspondence, how are we going to recognize these radical extension fields by their automorphism groups, by their Galois groups? So here's another picture of a radical extension E over F that has k steps along the way. Each time we're adjoining a simple i jth root. And an understanding of how we can recognize a radical extension by the automorphism group is exactly what we're going to need to unlock the mystery of the quintic formula. Because Galois groups of quintics, it turns out, can be very much more complicated than Galois groups of quartics, cubics, and quadratics. So what do we see here? First of all, we see a sequence of intermediate subfields between F and E. After all, that's what this tower really gives us, is it gives us one particular sequence of subfields that are intermediate between our base and our radical extension. Those are the E0s, E1s, E2s, up through EK minus 1s. And all of the extensions, all of the steps that we're taking up this tower, all have a lot in common. Right? Each time, we're just adjoining a simple kth root of some element which was in the previous field. So what are the similarities? The similarities are telling us that, first of all, when we make these extensions, if we have enough roots of unity at our disposal, then each of these extensions is going to turn out to be normal. Because the roots of these minimal polynomials will be the ijth root of alpha j, and that number multiplied by all of the ijth roots of unity. So as long as we have those roots of unity at our disposal, these extensions, every step of these extensions, is going to be a normal extension. Moreover, that's going to let us characterize the automorphism group of each one of the steps in this tower. Because the automorphisms have to send roots to roots of these polynomials, it's going to send the ijth root of unity to some power of the ijth root of unity. Because that's the only differentiation between the roots of these minimal polynomials. But if our automorphism group is made up of automorphisms that have that form, so if we say phi sub r is the automorphism that sends the ijth root of unity to the rth power of the ijth root of unity, then because they're so simple, we see that the composition of phi r with phi s is just going to be phi r s. Because we're going to have, we're going to raise this root of unity to the rth power and then to the sth power and exponents multiply when we take powers of powers. But because multiplication of integers is commutative, phi sub rs is the same thing as phi sub sr, which would be the composition of phi s with phi r. So what we see here is because the structure of the automorphisms here of these extensions has to be so simple, we end up with automorphisms that commute one with another. So all the automorphisms of the automorphism groups of each step of this extension up the tower to our radical extension those automorphisms will commute one with another. And that is highly significant. So let's wave our Galois correspondence magic wand and take this sequence of intermediate subfields and instead give us a sequence of intermediate subgroups between the Galois group of the total radical extension E over F and the trivial subgroup thereof. So we wave the wand and we get this sequence of subgroups. Now. According to our Galois correspondence theorem, the fact that we observed that all of the field extensions up here were normal extensions, again, as long as we have the roots of unity to play with, that will also imply that the subgroup containments that we get down here are all normal subgroup containments. So each of the g sub i's is actually a normal subgroup in g sub i minus 1 on the bottom. That's useful. Also, the last part of our Galois correspondence theorem implies that the properties of the automorphism groups of each step of the extension up the tower will descend to the properties of the quotients of those subgroups on the bottom, those normal subgroups on the bottom. And we observed on the previous slide that the automorphism groups are made up of automorphisms that commute at each step of the tower of field extensions. And therefore, the Galois correspondence is going to tell us that the quotient groups of each of these g sub i's by its normal subgroup g sub i minus 1, those quotient subgroups will all be abelian. So we've talked our way into a very powerful characterization of when a polynomial is solvable in radicals, in other words, when we have a radical extension e over f, we're going to get a, an automorphism group g, which has these normal subgroups as kind of a series, going from g all the way down to the trivial subgroup. So how are we going to recognize the Galois group of a solvable polynomial? In other words, the automorphism group of a radical extension E over F. We're going to recognize it 
by this very finite, because we only had k steps, descending, because we started from the whole group and are going to smaller and smaller subgroups as we go along. And it's a series of subgroups as we go from left to right here. And each step of that series is a normal subgroup. So algebraists call this a normal series for the group G. Actually, they call it a subnormal series for the group G. Should probably add that word over here, subnormal series. So it's a subnormal series of subgroups because at every step, G sub I is a normal subgroup in G sub I minus one. But then the last requirement is that the quotients of these groups by their normal subgroups have to be abelian. So G0 quotient G1 has to be isomorphic to an abelian group. G sub 1 quotient G2. G2 quotient G3. All the way up to our last step, G sub k minus 1 quotient GK. But GK is the trivial subgroup. So in particular, one of the things that this does for us is it tells us that this last group in our subnormal series must itself be an abelian group. So we're going to recognize the Galois group of a solvable polynomial by having a finite descending subnormal series of subgroups having abelian quotients. But that's a mouthful to say. So we abbreviate it by calling the group a solvable group. And the theorem that we had on the previous slide, which characterized the uh, Galois group of a, a normal extension and the solvability of a polynomial in radicals, we know that a polynomial is solvable in radicals by definition if its splitting field is a subfield of a radical extension of the base. But now we've characterized the Galois group of one of those radical extensions. And therefore, we get a new characterization that says that our polynomial is solvable in radicals if and only if, waving the Galois correspondence magic wand, its Galois group is one of these solvable groups. So after all of our work this semester, we've narrowed it down to this. This is our moment. Now we know how to recognize whether a polynomial is solvable by radicals merely using an abstract algebraic property of its Galois group. So now the question is, what can the Galois groups of polynomials be based on the degree of those polynomials? We know that the Galois groups of polynomials of degrees 2, 3, and 4 have to be subgroups, respectively, of S2, S3, and S4. But then polynomials of degree 5 will have Galois groups that are subgroups of S5. And those polynomials are solvable in radicals if and only if their Galois groups are solvable groups. So it'll be up to us to investigate what happens to the solvability of groups as we proceed in the symmetric groups from S2 to S3 to S4 to S5.